Hello. It is a tremendous pleasure to be taking part in this series of webinars. In this one, I have the honour to discuss the opportunities and risks around nature-based solutions to the drivers and to the impacts of climate change. So as you know, the evidence is now very clear. Not only are we failing to stabilise the climate or stem the tide of biodiversity loss, but these failures are increasing poverty and inequality around the globe and are severely undermining the development gains of the 20th century. Now, as evidence builds uh, that humanity is driving the state of natural systems on which it depends beyond the point of no return, it has become very clear that larger scale and much more coherent approaches to tackling global challenges are needed. Now, one such family of approaches that have recently risen in prominence on political and business agendas are so-called nature-based solutions. Put very simply, these are actions that involve the protection, restoration or management of ecosystems, the sustainable management of working lands such as croplands or timberlands, or the creation of new ecosystems in and around cities or across the wider landscape. Now, nature-based solutions are important because they represent a new framing of our relationship with nature. Rather than regarding natural ecosystems as simply being very vulnerable to human activities, they are instead recognised as major, as major allies in the fight against global change. Now, this recognition is deeply rooted in the scientific knowledge that healthy, biodiverse ecosystems produce a very wide range of services on which sustainable development and human well-being ultimately depends. The recognition is also rooted in the fact that climate change and biodiversity loss share some of the same drivers and hence some of the same solutions. In particular, land use change is both the biggest driver of biodiversity declines, accounting for around 30%, and the second biggest source of greenhouse gas emissions, accounting for around 23%. So addressing land use change through a variety of different sorts of nature-based solutions can therefore, in theory, both slow warming and help uh, us adapt to the effects of climate change and arrest biodiversity declines. For example, there is growing evidence that protecting grasslands and forests and wetlands in catchments secures and regulates water supplies, shields communities and infrastructure from floods, erosion and landslides. There is also evidence that restoring coastal wetlands and reefs protects um, against storm surges and erosion. Improved management of working lands, meanwhile, can stabilise or even enhance crop yields in drier, more variable climates. And the establishment of new ecosystems, such as green and blue infrastructure in our cities, can help with cooling and flood abatement while reducing air pollution and providing uh, a wide range of now very well documented mental uh, and physical health benefits. In other words, nature-based solutions can support human adaptation to climate change impacts whilst also protecting biodiversity. Nature-based solutions can also make a great deal of economic sense. They are generally low risk and low cost to implement. According to various recent studies, the ben for example, the benefits of mangrove restoration, and those include uh, the benefits of fisheries, forestry, recreation, and especially disaster risk reduction, have been estimated to be around up to 10 times the cost of implementation. Meanwhile, nature-based coastal defence projects are between two to five times more cost effective compared to engineered structures. And salt marshes protect around 23 billion US dollars worth of property and infrastructure during hurricanes each year in northeastern USA, while annual damages from flooding would double and costs from storms would triple in the absence of reefs globally. Now, nature-based solutions can also stimulate the economy, which is incredibly um, important uh, at this time as we all think about how we're going to recover from and put in pl plans in place to recover from the effects of uh, co the COVID virus and this pandemic that we're in. So we know that nature-based solutions all over the world provide a sustainable source of income for local people. Um, they can also generate more jobs than investment in other sectors. For example, it was estimated that for every one million US dollars invested in coastal habitat restoration in the USA, 40 new jobs are created, compared to 19 for investment in the aviation industry, seven for finance and five for oil and gas. Meanwhile, the Food and Land Use Coalition recently estimated that new investment of around 350 billion US dollars a year in sustainable food and land use systems could create more than 120 million new jobs and generate around $4.5 trillion in new business opportunities worldwide each year by 2030. 
In addition, such actions, nature-based solutions, if properly implemented, can help to mitigate the effects of, well, mitigate climate change by protecting or enhancing carbon sinks whilst reducing emissions from land use and sea use change. Now, we know that ecosystems on land and in the sea play a really critical role in the global carbon cycle. Agriculture, forestry and other land uses account for around 13% of total net human-caused emissions of carbon dioxide, while terrestrial ecosystems currently draw down approximately 29% of uh, carbon dioxide emissions and the ocean removes around 24%. Now, oceans and terrestrial ecosystems have the potential to remove and store considerably more carbon were nature-based solutions to be scaled up. Now, estimating the global potential of nature-based solutions for climate change mitigation is really complicated. Estimates are highly dependent on various assumptions, for example, regarding future trends in the land use sector and supply, uh, both on the demand and supply, supply side, carbon saturation point and mature forests, which can range um, greatly depending on, on which type of forest, what part of the world you're talking about. It also is influenced by a whole range of different constraints on the implementation of nature-based solutions, including their feasibility politically and economically, major issues, important concerns around land rights and tenure, and of course, safeguards for food security and biodiversity. Meanwhile, the price of carbon is also an incredibly important consideration. And the elephant in the room in all conversations about nature-based solutions for mitigation is that the impacts of climate change on the health and functionality of ecosystems and their capacity to sequester and store carbon. Okay, so this is a very active area of research. Lots of work has been conducted to refine estimates and models are improving all the time. Now, some of the best and most influential work has been led by uh, Bronson Griscom, who now works at Conservation International, who first estimated how we might enhance sinks and reduce sources of greenhouse gases by scaling up the protection, restoration, and improving the man management of our lands. So he recently teamed up with colleagues here in Oxford to generate new estimates using a much more tightly constrained model. And this is a summary of the findings. Um, now, according to this study, if we scale up nature-based solutions to the maximum extent possible, then we, rec we can reduce the total amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere by around 10 gigatons of carbon dioxide per year. These estimates suggest that the most significant contributions for cost-effective avoided emissions of carbon dioxide come from protecting intact lands, while managing working lands provides the greatest contribution to the global carbon sink, followed by restoring native cover. Now, protected areas established to shield intact ecosystems from human influence also play a key role, as intact ecosystems store more carbon and are much more resilient in the face of climate extremes and pathogens. So the total mitigation potentials of improvements in the land use sector, including coastal ecosystems, comes to around, as I say, 10 gigatons of carbon dioxide a year. Now, on the basis of this figure, a powerful statement has been regarding nature-based solutions has been circulating in business and policy discourse. And that is that nature-based solutions have the potential to provide around 30% of the cost-effective carbon dioxide mitigation needed through to 2030 to keep warming less than two degrees. However, it's vitally important to understand that this potential can only be achieved in tandem with a rapid and aggressive decarbonisation of the global economy. In other words, you can't have 30% provided by nature-based solutions without also having the 70% achievable through decarbonisation. In other words, we must decarbonise and scale up nature-based solutions. It really isn't an either or. Now, as a result of growing evidence and awareness of the potential of nature-based solutions for addressing both the climate change and biodiversity crises, nature-based solutions have been gaining traction in business and government's discourse in recent years. Over the last 12 months, dozens of pledges um, and new funding streams for nature-based solutions have been announced by countries and companies. Very recently, um, at the first United Nations Summit on Biodiversity this, uh, this September, we saw um, 76, over 76 now nations sign the Leaders' Pledge for Nature. Now, signatories for this pledge have committed to cooperating and holding one another to account in their joint mission to reverse biodiversity loss by 2030. Now, while these commitments are really encouraging and may represent a significant shift in both the business community and in governments, very few pledges for nature define very clear and actionable uh, plans for implementing and verifying commitments. Moreover, although well-designed nature-based solutions can deliver multiple benefits for people in nature, 
As you'll be aware, much of the recent limelight has been very narrowly focused on tree planting as a silver bullet climate solution. Yet tree planting, especially afforestation, which is a technical term meaning you know, tree planting on naturally treeless habitats, uh, is only a small part of the climate solution uh, and only works, as I say, in tandem with strict decarbonisation. And there are really major concerns now that this emphasis on tree planting, especially on afforestation, as a silver bullet climate solution is distracting from the need to decarbonize our energy systems and also distracting from our need to protect existing intact ecosystems and their vast reserves of carbon. And there is also concern that expansion of forestry framed as a climate change mitigation solution is coming at the cost of carbon rich and biodiverse native ecosystems. This is hugely problematic and I really want to emphasize this. A forest really is not a crop of trees, and a crop of trees really isn't a climate solution. The trees are incredibly important. They produce oxygen, they draw down carbon dioxide, they also regulate water cycles, bind soils and slopes, and support countless organisms, ranging from microbes that cycle nutrients to pollinating animals and other animals that control pests and disperse seeds and so forth. But the capacity of trees to perform and to support these vital ecosystem functions depends on the overall health, on the overall diversity and resilience of the ecosystems in which they grow. So healthy, intact, biodiverse ecosystems are part of the climate change solution, but crops of trees, afforestation, in other words, is not. So as I say, the problem with focusing on tree planting as a climate solution is it distracts from the need to keep fossil fuels in the ground. You know, unless we rapidly decarbonize our economies, global heating will damage our ecosystems beyond recovery. Okay. Um, there tends to be a focus on tree planting rather than tree stewardship. You know, trees need a lot of care as they grow, and this needs to be taken account of when budgeting for nature-based solutions. And tree plantations often only offer very short-term or at least very high-risk carbon stores. Much harvested wood is for short of products, and also those uh, plantations tend to have very few species in them. Uh, and therefore tend to have low resilience to new pathogens and diseases, which are becoming much more common um, in a rapidly warming world. As I say, other problems with the focus on tree planting as a climate solution, they threaten crit other critically important habitats, such as wetlands, peatlands, which is a big problem um, in many parts of the world, including my own country, grasslands that are both rich in carbon and biodiversity, and uh, natural forests are, in many parts of the world, being replaced by tree plantations, leading to a net loss of biodiversity and carbon. Um, and also, very importantly, you know, sometimes these um, afforestation programs overlook human rights, overlook um, the, the rights of indigenous peoples and local communities, you know, on whose land are these trees being planted. Some examples in Chile between 1986 and 2011, plantation forests doubled with government, uh, the area covered by plantation forests doubled with the help of government subsidies. Over this time period, the carbon stored only increased by 2%, where, while native Nothophagus forests, which are very biodiverse, shrunk by 13%. And this, so this is a situation where government subsidies uh, for plantation forestry accelerated biodiversity loss with very little benefits in terms of the carbon. Meanwhile, in Cambodia, there was a 34,000 hectare concession with an, involving a uh, monoculture of acacia, so non-native, single species. Um, and this replaced some an area of lowland tropical rainforest, which is very, very rich in species, uh, genetic diversity and carbon. Local communities were possessed from land and much biodiversity was lost. Um, and that was a concession that was established with the goal of mitigating climate change. So on the basis of all this, I do urge business leaders, policymakers, and practitioners across the globe to consider the four guiding principles for investment in nature-based solutions to provide sustainable benefits to society. So these are a set of four high-level guidelines that were put together by a large group of scientific institutions and organizations from both the conservation and development sector early in 2020. The first guideline is that nature-based solutions are not a substitute for decarbonizing the economy, we need to decarbonize and we need to invest in nature and any entity wishing to offset emissions must have credible and ambitious plans to achieve net zero quickly. 
The second guideline is that nature-based solutions need to be implemented in a wide range of ecosystems, not just forests, and especially not exotic forests. Thirdly, nature-based and critically, nature-based solutions must be implemented with by and for people, in other words, with robust social, social safeguards, with full engagement of local communities and indigenous people and in respect of their rights, cultural rights and ecological rights. And fourthly, nature-based solutions su should support biodiversity, as in the diversity of life from the level of gene to the level of the ecosystem. And I want to sort of say, as I conclude, you know, that Biodiversity is not wildlife and it's not a nice to have an additional benefit of working with nature. Biodiversity is that which secures the flow of all that we need from nature now and into the future. Biodiversity ensures the stability, productivity and resilience of our ecosystems. And in a rapidly changing world, that is absolutely essential. You know, diverse ecosystems are more resistant to fire to diseases, to floods and droughts. And so if we don't ensure that biodiversity is supported or enhanced as we design and implement nature-based solutions, then nature won't be able to provide any solutions at all. So working with nature, being careful stewards of our ecosystems is absolutely fundamental to creating flourishing, healthy societies and businesses. And it shouldn't be the sole responsibility of the conservation community, but all our responsibilities. Nature is after all our life support system and we ignore it, we undervalue it at our peril. And the evidence for that has never been clearer. Thank you very much.